everyone. My name is Wendy Risley, and I would like to welcome you to our Fall 2021 Native Plant Sale. This fall, we will be focusing on trees at our Native Plant Sale. One of the main reasons that we decided to focus on trees in the fall is because the fall is a great time of the year to plant trees. A lot of times the trees are dormant and they have a chance to acclimate and get their roots down before a long, hot summer comes along. Texas established in 2013 Texas State Arbor Day. It's the first Friday of November. So when you come to the plant sale and you are choosing your trees, hopefully you've had a chance to look online and choose your trees, and then at your house you should choose your location. One mistake that I've made, and I'm assuming other people as well, is when you buy a tree, it might be this big, or you know maybe even this tall, but you don't consider how large it's going to be and how wide it's going to be. And a lot of times we plant it in a space that's just not quite big enough. Another thing to consider when planting trees is looking at the underground utility lines. There's a number, it's 811, and those folks will come out for free um, out to your house, and it's usually pretty quick, a couple of days, and they will come out and mark where all your underlying utilities happen to be. So we have these three great oak trees in my backyard, and those trees were here before we moved in. And we called the 811 number to plant a wax myrtle. We found out that these three big oak trees are actually planted right on top of our gas line. So that's not good. That's why it's important to call 811. So people love to have trees in their backyards for various reasons. Um, they give us shade. They give us oxygen, they sequester carbon, they uh, stabilize our soils. But the main reason I love having trees in my backyard is for wildlife. And it's just amazing how much more wildlife will come into your yard if you have some trees in your yard. We don't think about this often, but oak trees are one of the best trees that you can have for wildlife in Texas. They're one of our biggest trees, but they are host to several different species, like hundreds of species of butterflies and moths and other insects that are up there. And once you have all the insects in your trees, then that brings in a lot of uh, diversity of bird life. So in the spring, we have a lot of migratory songbirds coming through. It's just really nice to be able to sit here in the backyard with our binoculars and look up there and see those. And if we didn't have trees in our backyard, we'd miss out on that. Another tree that we have in our backyard is an understory tree, and this one is called an eastern red bud. It's got these beautiful leaves on it that look like hearts, and this tree is deciduous, so it will lose its leaves in the late fall. In the spring, it has some really beautiful pink flowers on it early in the spring, so it's one of the very first nectar sources. So we have lots of bees and other pollinators on this in the springtime. And then it's a really cool thing about this. This plant, if you see this little semicircle cut out, this plant is also used by the leaf cutter bees. So they'll take a piece of this leaf and put it in with their nest to separate the cells. So this is our red bud. And like I said, it's deciduous. It'll lose its leaves. And we have a, a bird feeder, feeder that we hang right here in the winter. And it's just Nice having this tree here so the goldfinch can just perch on that. The goldfinch and chickadees and uh, sometimes cardinals will come and feed on that as well. So again, if we didn't have a tree in our backyard, we wouldn't have the wildlife here. Another tree that we bought at the Native Plant Society sale is parsley hawthorn. And parsley hawthorn is a really nice white bloom in the spring. Again, a great pollinator food. And it also has um, leaves that are really unique. It looks like a parsley plant. And this plant is a host plant for three butterfly species, the gray hair streak, the red spotted purple, and the ice roy. So it's really nice to have these in your backyard. Again, I want to have more wildlife in my backyard, which is the main reason that I like having trees in our backyard. So I just want to end this with a quote, all plants are not created equal, particularly in their ability to support wildlife. Most of our native plant eaters are not able to eat alien plants and we are replacing native plants with alien species at an alarming rate, especially in the suburban gardens on which our wildlife increasingly depends. 
My central message is that unless we restore native plants to our suburban ecosystems, the future of biodiversity in the United States is dim. Doug Talame, bringing nature home. With that, I encourage everyone to come out and see us on Saturday, October 9th, for our native plant sale and join the Clear Lake Chapter Native Plant Society. We would love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. You've convinced me. I need a tree or two. So you've decided you want to plant a tree, but you're not sure which one to get. If you're like me, you want all the trees. But there are some things to take into consideration before you start planting. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Available space is probably the most overlooked consideration when deciding what tree to plant. And that is why planning is key. Before you plant, it's important to know what the tree is going to look like as it reaches maturity. With a little research and a simple layout, you can create a landscape design that will fit your needs. A good landscape plan takes each tree into consideration. Let's dig in. Height. Will the tree bump into anything when it is fully grown? Go outside and walk to the spot where your tree will go and look up. Are there power lines overhead? Are there other tall trees? If there are no issues there, think about how the tree will impact the view as it grows. Shade trees have a spreading canopy on top of a much narrower trunk, so the views aren't impacted as much at the ground level. But they may block the entire view from a second-story window or balcony. Many evergreens have branches all the way to the ground which may mean that everything behind them disappears. That's great if you're creating a barrier, but it's less desirable if you want to admire the full expanse of your space. Width. You'll want to allow enough space for the trunk, roots, and canopy to grow. Choose the right planting spot at least 15 feet from buildings so roots and branches have room to grow and don't invade surrounding infrastructure such as sidewalks and pipes. This spacing guide from Arbor Day Foundation recommends eight to 10 feet minimum spacing from the wall of a one-story building for small trees, 15 feet for medium trees, and 20 feet for large trees. Canopy spread. The canopy is a layer of leaves and branches that cover the ground when viewed from above. What is the leaf cover like? Will you have light shade, dappled shade, or dense shade? If you or your neighbors already have trees, how will the canopy combine with the canopies of those trees? It's also important to consider any buildings or structures with which the canopy may conflict. Is the tree deciduous or evergreen? Will it lose its leaves in the winter? Deciduous trees save energy in summer by shading your house, paved areas, and air conditioners. Small deciduous trees and shrubs also can serve as effective wind barriers. You'll want to plant deciduous trees so they will shade west-facing surfaces from 3 to 7 p.m. during June, July, and August. Large and small evergreen trees and shrubs save energy by slowing cold winds in the winter. Form or shape. A columnar tree will grow in less space. Round and V-shaped species will need more space and they provide the most shade. Growth rate is another thing to consider. How long will it take for your tree to reach its full height? Slow growing species typically live longer than fast growing species, which is another thing you want to think about. Then we have soil, sun, and water requirements. Trees have specific requirements for sunlight, soil, 
and water. A tree that needs a full sun exposure may not survive if planted in shade, and a tree that thrives in dry soil might die if planted in poorly drained soil. You'll want to choose a tree that will grow well in the conditions of your neighborhood and your yard's specific conditions. Debris. How much time do you want to spend on cleaning up? Some trees drop seed pods, fruits, or nuts. No one wants messy droppings on busy sidewalks. Some of the droppings are sharp or uncomfortable to walk on. Sweet gum comes to mind. And others create extensive debris that requires a lot of cleanup. Leaves, acorns, catkins. On the other hand, instant mulch. And finally, consider function. What would you like your tree to do? Do you want a shade tree? A flowering tree? One that will attract wildlife? Or something else? One of the best ways to narrow down your choices is to determine the purpose of the trees in your landscape. Shade trees. Who doesn't love the shade of a tree on a Houston summer day? Shade trees are usually dense with broad leaves. If you want lighter shade, choose a tree with finer foliage. Shade trees are tall and rounded or V-shaped with room to walk underneath the branches. And they are deciduous. Deciduous shade trees should be planted on the south and west sides of your house to provide cooling shade in the summer and allow the sun to warm your house in the winter. Oaks, ash, elms, maples, and sycamore trees are all examples of shade trees. Specimen or ornamental trees. Specimen trees are planted by themselves, mainly for ornamental purposes. They may provide some shade for seating areas. Look for trees with showy flowers, fall foliage, berries, unusual shapes, or interesting bark. Some examples include dogwood, red bud, red maple, magnolia, and yopon. Street trees. Trees planted along the street must be tough in order to withstand the stresses of traffic, pavement, heat, and poor soils. They shouldn't drop large fruits, nuts, or branches that could interfere with car or foot traffic. Common street trees include elm, fringe tree, holly, and oaks. Windbreaks and screening trees. Windbreak trees are planted to provide a buffer. The best windbreak trees are dense evergreens which provide year-round protection. Windbreaks are best planted on the north side of your property. Screening trees are a beautiful and economical way to provide privacy and reduce noise. For an effective screen, choose trees with branches that start near the ground. They can be planted in a row or grouped more casually. A few examples are wax myrtle, yopon, and magnolia. Fruit trees. Fruit trees make excellent specimen trees while offering edible fruits for you and wildlife. Fruit trees include Mexican plum, pawpaw, Texas persimmon, which is also a larval host plant for the gray hair streak butterfly. All of these trees that I have mentioned are great for attracting wildlife to your yard. Planting a tree is one of the best low-cost investments you can make in your property. <coughs> trees clean the air, prevent erosion, and cool the landscape. And they'll even increase your property's value. To make sure you can reap the benefits that a tree provides, make your selection wisely. And don't forget to dial 811 before you dig. Next, we're going to look at a great resource that will help when selecting your tree. This is the Texas Tree Planting Guide, and it is a website uh, brought to us by the Texas A&M Forest Service. 
And I like this website because it has two options. You can do an express tree selector, which is a very quick way to find a tree. You simply click on that. You put in the county that you live in. So let's do Harris. And then you put in the size of the tree you want. So we're gonna say small. You click on show trees. And look at that. We have the Eastern Redbud, a Mexican plum, a fringe tree, and a hawthorn. So three of those trees were available um, pre-order and the Eastern Redbud will be available at the plant sale. So that's a nice way to get a quick tree for your yard. However, if you go to the custom tree selector, you can actually be more specific. So let's click on that. We'll do custom tree. So we'll go ahead and choose Harris County again. Then for option one, they want the space available. Let's say we have a large space. For option two, they want to know what size a tree. Preference, we can do small, medium, or large. Well, if we have a large space, let's just choose no preference. However, we do want to choose deciduous because we are interested in some shade so we can save energy. And then for option four, we want to click on is a Texas native. We always want to choose Texas native so we can increase the benefits of our tree. The wildlife will love it. And then finally, you choose um, the type of uh, conditions you have. So I'm going to say, Let's do um, poorly drained or stays wet. So a lot of us have clay. That's a, an easy choice here. So then you click on a show trees and you get a list of trees that are suitable for our area. So we have the bald cypress, um, although those throw up knees, so we may not want one of those. So let's look at possum haw. That's an interesting tree. Then you would click on more about this tree. And here you get some information. You'll get an illustration of the tree. You can see it in the spring and in the winter when it's lost its leaves. But you can see from the illustration that it has these red berries. And that's why we like this tree to provide food for the birds. And then you also have the common name, the Latin name, the size of the tree, um, we had no preference. So this will show us what type of tree this is. We have the leaf type, the growth rate. So this is a slow growing tree, its water needs, and then other attributes that we may be interested in. What I also like about this website is you can go down to the tree planting tools. And if you click on that, and that's at the bottom of the page, it provides a lot of resources for choosing your tree, how to plant your tree and so on. So let's look at one of these, planting for energy efficiency. If you click on that tool, here it'll show you where you wanna plant your trees. It shows you how they can help you. So if you click on it, you'll get a nice little video and it kind of explains what you see on this page. So I'm going to back, go back to the home page, and then that third selection, the tree planting and care, that one goes to the page we were just on, the tree planting tools. So if you already um, know what tree you want, but you need some advice, that's a good place to go. Wouldn't an instant shade tree be a nice addition to our landscape? The research by the International Society of Arboriculture says not so fast. The evidence supports the advice that big trees are not necessarily better for planting. Because small trees experience less root loss when transplanted, they establish more quickly, usually overtaking their larger counterparts after just a few years. 
the root loss from removing or cutting pot-bound roots on a big tree means it will be dependent on you for watering until it can forage for enough water to support the tree. You may need to water a larger tree as much as 10 gallons a week for two or more years, while a smaller tree could be on its own after a few weeks to months. Ideally, a tree that is about four to five feet tall, grown in a container about one third of the tree height, is a good size to be firmly established with energy reserves, but is not so big that it needs excessive care after transplanting. If you purchased one of the pre-order wax myrtles in the five gallon container for $25, your tree will most likely be the size of this $75 tree in two years. They are very fast growing. Another thought on size, you will most likely need a nursery to deliver, dig a hole, and plant a 30 or 45 gallon tree. The cost for such a service can range from $750 to $1,500. The moral of this story is spend less money on the tree and more time on the preparation of the planting hole and root ball. Yes, this is a post, but it's also how you see many of our trees planted. Way too deep. The root flare of the tree should be above the soil surface, not below. Eight oak trees planted in eight parking spaces. Girdling roots caused by poor planting techniques. It can kill the tree. Thanks, Martha, for that great insight. Stick around. Next up, we have Rowena and Bev demonstrate how to plant a tree. Today, we are gonna give instructions for planting a tree. Rowena is gonna show us the best way for a 30 gallon pot. Do you understand that the bigger trees, you might need to do more inches than what we're doing on this pot? but we're gonna start with this one. The first thing you do is you put the pot where you think the tree is supposed to go. You try and get two inches away from the bottom of the pot and start digging your hole. You push in, move over, push in, move over, and go all the way around. Then when you have the hole, you move the plant and then you dig the hole. And when you're done digging the hole, now you have to start doing some hole care. And she's gonna show you what that's like. When we go over to this hole, which was dug previously, and a nice job at that, and then we had a big rainstorm, so excuse the water. But what we do is we put our shovel to the bottom and we just sort of zigzag it right and left. You just try and interrupt the soil so that it's chopped up a little. Then, because we are in Texas and our soil oftentimes needs to be amended to some extent, we want to make sure that the hole is two inches shorter than our dirt line in the bucket, but then we want to add hummus and potting mixture to the bottom of the hole so that when we put the tree in there, we are laying on a nice pile of substrate. And the one thing you want to remember when you're planting a tree, you really don't know when your tree got into the pot that you purchased. So what you need to know is that roots, by definition, have had to orient themselves in a circle. So she's gonna go back to the hole. She's gonna go down and make sure that that's sort of chopped around. She's gonna score the sides just a couple of times on each side, all for the sake of the roots. So when we get to the tree, the one thing that you really need to be concerned with 
is what those roots are doing. If they are entirely in a circle, that is big trouble and you're gonna have to do big pruning. Because what we want is those roots to be in the right direction and relaxed enough that they'll start reaching for these scores and immediately starting to go into the sides of the dirt. Okay, so now we tip the tree over on its side. You can hit it with a mallet, you can roll it and squeeze it. You wanna break up the adhesion that it has to its side. It helps if two people work at the same time. You hold it so that it's as round as can be and then it's pretty easy to pull it out. Looking at this tree, it is not at all root bound so the amount of work that needs to be done to the roots looks pretty minimal, and that's a good thing. That means the roots have not established themselves in a circle, and they're willing to be established in the hole. Now you can roll the, the tree into the hole. Plop. Very good. Oh, nice. That's about where you want it, too. Now, understand, these circumstances are a little different because this water hole is saturated, but the concept is really the same. So what you want to do is walk on two sides and look and see if you like the orientation of the trunk. Is it straight enough? You have to look at it from at least two sides. I think I'm going to turn it slightly. Kadoki. All right. The root of the tree is higher than the surround, and that's really what you want. So then you take your shovel again and take the shoulder off the root ball. Okay, very good. Then start taking some of your soil and putting it toward the edges. That's exactly right. And start poking it in and poking it in. A big mistake that a lot of people make, you don't ever step or put pressure on that root ball from this point on. We don't stand on it. We don't press it. We don't stop it down in any way, shape, or form. And this should be the best dirt you have. We try as hard as we can not to put the clay in the hole along the side like this. And this is being done very well. I think you should consider this a good model. So when we're ready for the clay that we've dug out, since we've put the good soil under the tree and now we're putting the good soil around the tree, if we have clay soil, we will put that toward the top but the side of the tree. Let me explain that better. It's okay to put the clay on top of the root ball because we're gonna drag it back out. We're gonna try and use the clay to make the moat around the tree so that we can keep water in, keep the people that are running around with weed whackers from hitting the, the trunk. We're convincing them that there's a very important tree sitting right here. And Barry from Trees for Houston likes to have the clay right up around the trunk and then drag it away because he says that really reduces the amount of air pockets in there. Luckily, Rowena has gloves on so she can lean down there in a minute and start pulling the clay that's on top of the root ball and around the trunk out to start forming a moat. Very good. Now, a lot of the trees that are being sold at the, at the plant sale are in five and 10 gallon buckets. So it would be a smaller, actually easier job than this, but the process is the same. Remember, if you get a root ball that has roots that are going in circles around it, you have to take your scissors or your clippers and cut them and pull them so that they are not in a circle orientation anymore. If you want your tree to develop roots that are gonna reach out into the ground and stabilize itself against wind and flood 
and be able to heal itself if, after a drought. You want those roots aiming out. We're good. That is a very nice looking persimmon tree and a very nice looking hole with a moat. Thank you so much, Bethany. Okay, so we did have a lot of success with our pre-ordered trees, but one of the things that didn't sell out because I ordered lots of them is wax myrtle, um, otherwise known as bayberry. This is a lovely small tree or a shrub. And what makes it great is that, you know, you can plant several of them and they can be very successfully clipped into a hedge. So um, it's a good replacement for all those ligustrums that you have planted around, either planted into rows or hedges or little balls or whatever. You can create a more um, structured and formal look with these by clipping them into a hedge and they will thicken out and they will form a nice hedge. Uh, they're also good for wildlife. Um, they have winter uh, berries on them in the winter time. They're a kind of a pale gray color. The birds love those, um, especially the ones that come visit us in the, in the winter. And, you know, being a native plant, it's not known for all the um, insect larvae it hosts, but it does host a few. Uh, it's very highly deer resistant. So uh, if you're living out near the country where you've got deer coming near your property, this might make a good hedge to cut them off. It does like a lot of water, but once it's established, uh, we've got a hedge of it. It's established now. We don't actually give it any extra water now that it's, it's fully grown. It does well in light and in part shade. So if you've got that corner that you will need to fit something in, sorry, in sun and part shade, but it will not grow it if it's fully shady. Next one is the Yopon Holly. Now, I remember this being plant of the month not so long ago, and we made tea out of it. This picture here is a tree that looks fairly big. I haven't actually myself seen them get that big, but again, they can be clipped and shaped into a hedge, maybe not quite as a thick hedge as the wax myrtle, but it is evergreen. It doesn't usually grow much higher than 25 feet. And again, it produces the winter berries that are not only ornamental, but they are very attractive to birds. It attracts birds and songbirds, bees, fruit mammals, by that we mean squirrels, <laughs> nectar insects, and it makes a good nesting site. We do in the, uh, in the summertime, we have mockingbirds nesting in there, and we have lots of Audubon warblers in it in, over the winter time. They like to maybe not nest, but they like to shelter inside our wax myrtle. Okay, the American beauty berry. Now we have some smaller ones, but we this time we also bought in some bigger ones. They're a good size. And if you want to get, put something in and have it there immediately, it's a good option. It's an excellent plant for Houston. It grows well in Houston. It's very ornamental with its berries and the birds love the berries. So there is, can be a problem. If the birds find your American beauty berry early on in the season, they will strip it bare. But uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're worried about that, maybe plant more than one. It grows in partial shade. Uh, it'll grow underneath larger shade forming trees or in the shade of your home. It takes moderate amount of water, but then again, you know, water it while it's young. But once it's mature after a year or so, you don't need to worry about it again. It'll look after itself. Another one that we have for the first time this time, we bought in some pawpaws, which is a native fruit. They do taste a little bit like banana. I don't know if you've had them. It's not the same as a papaya. They are different to papaya, but they are native in Texas, more to, to East Texas, but um, they grow as an understory tree, so they can take some shade. They're very resistant to deer, and uh, the fruit is not only enjoyed by us, but it's enjoyed by um, other animals as well. They will come and pick the fruit, so you have to keep an eye on it. When the, when the skin is brown, that's when the fruit is ripe. And I've been told what you do is you split it in half and you eat it with a spoon like you would a kiwi fruit. It's the larval host for the zebra fault swallowtail and for the pawpaw sphinx. Okay, and we actually have several oaks. We've got the chinkapin oak. I think we have one of those that hasn't been sold, but we also have some live oaks, a few live oaks and a few uh, swamp chestnut oaks that are for sale. These make lovely shade trees. They do take longer to grow than some of the other trees, but they are so useful for wildlife. You know, they um, attract all kinds of birds. 
those that um, will eat an acorn, bigger ones that would eat an acorn, uh, the birds that like to feed on insects that are hiding underneath the, uh, the bark. Um, and then also it is a larval host for all sorts of butterflies and moths and gall insects and everything like that. So um, it, lots of insects there for birds to pick off and feed their growing young. So it is a very bird friendly tree, very useful. And as I said, they make nice shade trees as well. This chinkapin oak is more found in where there's limestone and calciferous so and soils, but they can be adaptable to our soils. The other two that I mentioned, the swamp chestnut oak and the live oak, they work very well down here. So you should get a good success with them. Chinkapin oak is called that because the leaf is the same shape, a similar shape as a chinkapin bush. Uh, there is a warning together with the this oak tree, not all oak trees, but if you eat the oak acorns raw yourself, they're edible, but they can cause a stomach upset. If you cook them, you know, you, you, you soak them to leach out the tannins first or boil them to leach out the tannins, and then you can use them as a type of flour, grind them out and use them as a type of flour substitute. Okay, so those are the main trees that have not been sold out. We also were donated some Texas mountain laurels which I know some people will say, you know, aren't really for our area, but some people do grow them successfully. So they're very small ones They were grown by one of our members and he donated them to us. So if you enjoy Texas Mountain Laurel, I suggest you buy one. They're going to be very cheap. Three dollars, I believe, we'll put on them and, you know, go and try it out. We also have new, our Clear Lake Pollinator Garden signs. We were asked about these a lot. So we went ahead and Mary Horn, our very own Mary Horn, who used to be our president, designed them. They are about the size of other not native pollinator garden signs and they're on a short stake. So you can add them to your front yard or you can add them to your pocket prairie or you can add them to wherever you've been planting native plants for a pollinator garden or for birds, whatever, just to explain why you're gardening what you're gardening. It's a nice exposure for um, our chapter of Nemsot and um, only $25. So uh, feel free to uh, support us and to give our chapter a little bit more exposure by buying one of those. If you go to our website, you're going to find maps, you're going to find the plant lists and the descriptions. And uh, if you subscribe to our website, you'll get an email every time something new is updated. And I, of course, have to say thank you to the whole plant sale committee and to all of the volunteers. It's been a massive effort and everyone's come together and uh, hopefully everyone will enjoy themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm.